long time, I really didn't have a solid answer with the question, what's your favorite dinosaur? It was hard to choose, especially because I'm not a very decisive person. I usually said Allosaurus because I thought it was a neat predator. It probably hunted in packs, it was taller than a man, and had long deadly arms, and it used its mouth like a hatchet to chop down onto its prey. Sometimes I said Utah Raptor. It was a dromaeosaur bigger than a grizzly bear, and you could easily fit your entire head in its maw. But despite the size, it still had dromaeosaur hands, talons, and behavior. To help its case, I even had the honor of talking to Jim Kirkland, the man who discovered Utah Raptor. He's the state paleontologist of Utah, and he's very nice. We talked about the block, the nickname for a giant hunk of stone containing several Utah Raptor individuals, including adults, teens, and little baby raptors. The raptors had become trapped in quicksand after trying to feed on an iguanodontid that had become trapped before them. The presence of babies in the rock strongly suggests that Utah raptors hunted as a family like modern day wolves, although probably less connected. As Utah raptors had many hatchlings and often, Jim speculated that these babies would have acted almost as cannon fodder during a hunt, a, a tool almost. They would run out into a herd of prey and spook them, separating them. Many would have died in the process, but it wouldn't have been a major loss for the family because there's so many. It was fun talking to Jim, and it gave me a new appreciation for the world's largest dromaeosaur. Last year, in the first year of high school, I started a new project with my friend Sam. He had the idea to make a comic about dinosaurs, a highly scientific and accurate graphic novel that could act as both a teaching tool and a good story. First, before I could do the drawing, we had to figure out what dinosaur we wanted as the main character. I wanted to do a Tyrannosaurid like Gorgosaurus libratus. It lived just south of Tyrannosaurus rex, and it was just a bit taller than a human. Even then, it weighed more than two metric tons as an adult. Its name means dreadful lizard. I wanted to incorporate the mass gatherings and almost ritual head-biting that Tyrannosaurians like Gorgosaurus or Albertosaurus are known for, or at least known to do. But we didn't pick one of these classic Northwestern Tyrannosaurs. Someone on the r slash dinosaurs subreddit suggested the Yixan formation as a potential setting for the comic. At the time, I don't remember being very knowledgeable on the Yixan. Maybe I'd heard it a few times, but that was it. So I dug into it a bit, because based on the Redditor's description, it sounded like a good place to put a graphic novel. The Yixan Formation is located near the border between China and North Korea in Laoning Province. The rock in the formation is mostly made up of basalts, an igneous rock. The rock comes from the early Cretaceous period, from 129.7 million to 122.1 million years ago. These periods of time inside of the early Cretaceous period are known as the Aptian and Barinian periods, respectively. I don't know if I'm saying that right. For context, Utah Raptor came into prominence during this time, 126 million years ago. The Ixan was cold, at least for the Cretaceous it was. The average yearly temperature was only about 10 degrees Celsius, which is very cold for a dinosaur. The land was ravaged by volcanic activity, and forest fires were a regular part of the landscape. But despite these factors, the Ixan was blooming with life. Boreal forests comprised of ferns, conifers, cycads, and ginkgos covered the land, and were separated from one another by commonplace freshwater streams and lakes. On the ground, there was no grass. There wouldn't be for another 100 million years or so. But there were flowering plants, some of the first of their kind. In the water, there were several species of fish that we know of. The most common of which is Lycoptera, a small fish that lived in shoals. Bigger than that was Protospherus. Yes, I had to look up the pronunciation. Turns out, Spherus is uh, also known as a Chinese paddlefish, or Chinese swordfish. And then Proto is just before. And Protospherus was related to and looked like modern day paddlefish. The apex predator of the waters was a little known shark, one without a name. It is only known from part of a fin spine, but from this we know it is related to the hybodonts. 
but these fish were only a tiny, tiny portion of the full ecosystem. Flying through the sky, a giant pterosaur scours for a place to land near the edge of the water. It's not after the fish, it's actually a stenochasmatid. If you don't recognize the name, then a simple way of explaining them is the fact that they're often compared to flamingos. They were filter feeders. They put their beaks in the water and sifted out small animals and plants. This Yixan stenochasmata is named Moganopterus, named after the legendary pair of swords Ganjian and Mo Yi, in reference to its sword-like jaws. It is just one of the many pterosaurs local to the area, taking advantage of the plentiful lakes and rivers. The water of the Yixan was probably central to the lives of many animals. By far the most interesting creatures of the Yixan inhabited the land. While the pterosaurs and fish are interesting in their own right, the real draw of the Yixan was its terrestrial animals, namely the early mammals and, yes, the dinosaurs. But before that, let's get a little context. In the early days of paleontology, and I mean early, dinosaurs were seen as giant, dumb, sluggish reptiles, failures that died out due to their own incompetence. Slowly, as we learned more about the dinosaurs, we realized that they weren't stupid, and they certainly weren't sluggish. This is best exemplified by Charles R. Knight's painting, Leaping Laylaps. It depicts two theropods, active and lively, fighting. Much more accurate than previous paintings of the same subject. But much later, we had a realization. We started to discover dinosaurs with feathers. The first of these amazing animals was a raccoon-sized compsognathid named Sinoceropteryx. The name means Chinese reptile wing, and it brings us back to the Yixan. Sinoceropteryx was an animal native to the Yixan, and it was decorated with red, black, and white colors with a banded tail. It was the first non-avian dinosaur to be found with feathers. It was only the first. We started to discover more and more feathers on more and more dinosaurs. Most of these dinosaurs were coming out of China, and a large percentage of those came from the Yixan. The reason the Yixan dinosaurs had feathers is almost certainly the temperature. The protofeather filaments of the dinosaurs would have protected them from the cold. The Yixan was a perfect setting for our comic, a prehistoric paradise, and the star of the show was obvious from the start. In 2012, Chinese paleontologist Zhu Xing unveiled a new paper in the journal Nature. It was titled A Gigantic Feathered Dinosaur from the Lower Cretaceous of China, and described a new genus of Tyrannosauroid, Eutyrannus holly, Zhu named it. The name means feathered tyrant, and for good reason. This Tyrannosaur was covered head to toe in feathers. There were filaments preserved in several locations on the body, the neck, the tail, the legs, the arms. It is believed that Eutyrannus's body was almost entirely covered with these primitive feathers. There were three Eutyrinus skeletons. The paleontologist didn't dig them up, but the fossil dealer who sold them claimed that all three skeletons were from the same quarry, supporting the idea that Tyrannosaurs hunted in groups. Among the skeletons was an adult, a subadult, and a juvenile. All three skeletons were mangled and flattened, but most of the bones are there. Nonetheless, it's a very well-preserved fossil. Other features of Eutyrannus include a bony crest atop its skull, as well as little keratin horns above the eyes. It had long arms and large claws that it would have used to hunt. Of course, a predator of that size needs something to hunt. There were lots of animals from the Yixan, most of which were birds and raptors. Confucianus was from the Yixan, as well as dozens of other avians like it, possessing that unique pair of feathers that form its tail. Additionally, there are a few relatives of Microraptor, four-winged paravian raptors like Changyui Raptor. A recent discovery that made its rounds from the Yixan was that of Mei Long, a tiny true daunted dinosaur perfectly preserved in the bird-like sleeping position, hence why its name means sleeping dragon. One of the most common dinosaurs of the Yixan is Cetacosaurus. It is one of the most well-understood dinosaurs around, as to my knowledge, it is the only dinosaur with scales that dinosaurs have been able to study the coloration of. A very well-preserved fossil was recovered, showing the Cetacosaur in what appears to be a swimming position. Scientists were able to study the pigments in the fossil and the soft tissue that was imprinted into the rock, giving us the most accurate depiction of a dinosaur to date. 
It had a few unique characteristics, one being countershading with green camouflage to blend into the forest environment like a great white shark blends in with the ocean. It had quills running down its back, which we know it only grew as an adult. Cetacosaur babies had fuzz. This wasn't the only Cetacosaur preserved swimming. There's also one of my personal favorite fossils, showing a Cetacosaur swimming beside a seemingly alarmed turtle called Ordosemes. Personally, I think Cetacosaurs would have lived in small groups. They might have sat down for the night in tall ferns, the dark green on their backs leading into their quills, which to a predator would seem like any other plant. From the fossil evidence, it would appear that it did spend time in the water. It probably ate seeds and conifer needles, stripping the branch with its beak, as indicated by the fact that the jaws of Cetacosaurus would move back and forth, allowing for the animal to shear off tough plant materials such as conifer needles. As cute as the parrot lizard is, it was prey to many predators of the Ixan. Not only Eutyranus, but other dinosaurs like Dilong. However, the only animal that has evidence that it actually ate Cetacosaurus wasn't a dinosaur. It was a proto-mammal named Repenomammus. The name is paradoxical almost, translating from Latin to mean reptile mammal. One of these badger-like animals was found with a Cetacosaurus hatchling in its stomach. But even though it did eat dinosaurs, it was still in the immense shadow of Eutyranus. Dongbei Titan, while poorly understood from little more than a few isolated bones from a single individual, is one of the only known sauropods from the Yixen, besides Euhalopus and a few as of yet undescribed sauropods. Eutyranus, standing up, only came to Dongbei Titan's shoulder level. Then the neck of Dongbei Titan towered above it. As for medium-sized herbivores, there was Bolong, an iguanodontid, and Jinzusaurus, a hadrosaur. The Ixen did have an ankylosaurid, which would be a large, tanky animal in any other part of the world, but in the Ixen it was special. Launingsaurus was a tiny ankylosaurid that ate fish, was semi-aquatic, and combined skeletal elements from both ankylosaurs and nodosaurs, leading paleontologists to name it L. paradoxus. Launingsaurus is a great example of how strange the Ixen can be. Other odd animals from the area include Xian Long, a flying lizard, Hyphalosaurus, which vaguely resembles the strange Triassic reptile Tanistrophius with its long neck, Caudipteryx, named that way for its elegant fan of feathers located at the end of its tail, and Bapausaurus, a Therizinosaurus that holds the title of the largest known feathered dinosaur after Eutyranus. So, why was the Ixan this diverse? Paleontologists believe that this is because of how volatile the Ixan was. The forest fires, volcanic eruptions, and the release of noxious gas from the lake bottoms would have frequently destroyed swaths of the environment, and then with the help of the nutrients left by the burnt vegetation, new forests and life would grow back even stronger. This destruction allowed the life of the Ixan to diversify at a faster pace than most other places on Earth. Additionally, during the early Cretaceous, the Ixan was closer to the middle of China, so there are many different kinds of habitats surrounding the region, which probably helped the ecosystem to diversify with the help of the volatility of the landscape. The fossils of the Ixen are preserved so well that you can see the colors inside the scales of a creature that died out millions of years ago. This is the doing of the fine silt that made up the riverbeds. The muddy sand at the bottom of lakes and rivers is often able to give paleontologists some of the best fossils around, such as the discovery of Borealapelta, a notosaur that died in a lake in Canada, or Cynoceropteryx, whose appearance was kept pristine by the silt. The Ixan was a truly remarkable place, where life laid out biological experiments that would change the world indefinitely. Not only did it help to give us modern-day birds, but it also revolutionized the field of paleontology. The Ixan was cold, harsh, and dangerous, but, as someone once said, life, uh, finds a way. And in case you haven't caught on, my favorite dinosaur is Eutyranus. Thanks for watching.